Texas Lutheran University. Today we have a special speaker, one of our own students, who did research this summer in Boston on Lyme disease. So she's going to tell you about Lyme disease and uh, I guess uh, anything else she wants to about uh, Boston and her, uh, her experiences there. So our, our good friend, uh, Sinead Patrick. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to tell you all right now, I'm actually kind of really nervous, so give me a chance. Um, so I'm going to talk to you all about today is my summer internship, and I went to Boston. And so first I'll talk to you about Boston, and then I'll talk to you about a topic that I got really passionate about. And thanks to Dr. Jonas for giving me the time to tell you guys what I learned. Um, so it's called Where's Abouts because one of the first things that I noticed was really difficult to adjust to was how they talked. Um, every time someone would hear me talk, they'd be like, oh, where's Abouts you from? And I was like, excuse me? And so that's um, also a picture of me in front of a Harvard Medical School. So I was kind of excited and it was really cold outside, but Where's Abouts was Boston. Um, okay. so. Where do I point this thing? <laughs> okay, how did I get there? Um, obviously, I flew. It was a little bit over 2,000 miles, and um, I spent about eight weeks there, which was the longest and farthest that I've ever been from my family, and that's including when I studied abroad in Mexico last year. So um, it was kind of scary, and I think the scariest part was that I went alone. Um, there was no other TLU students there. There was no one interning with me, it was just me all by myself. And the way that I got there was Dr. Nevena Zubsevich, she did a biology, blah, 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 a biology seminar, just like y'all are at right now, last year. And um, she came and talked to us. She was actually a TLU alum, and she was a double major in biology and physical, er, athletic training. And so if any of y'all know the athletic trainers, they are busy 24 seven, so it was pretty amazing that she was able to double major. She ended up becoming a physical therapist, and then after that decided she wanted to go to med school. She went to med school in um, California and got her DO there. And then I remember her telling me how she ended up getting to Harvard in the first place. It was kind of funny. She just decided to apply, and then when she got the acceptance letter for her residency, she actually called the admissions back and was like, I think you made a mistake. You sent me an acceptance letter. And so now she's at Harvard, she's an attending physician over there, and she is technically a PMNR physician, which is a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialized, and she also does research on her own, which is where I came in. And then additionally, if any of y'all have been to Boston or up northeast, it's really, really, really expensive. And so thankfully, I was awarded the Budwine Scholarship, which is a TLU biology scholarship, and basically, um, it's funded by the Budwine Foundation, which comes from a guy who knew a guy who knows another guy who probably likes hearts and knows another guy who knows Dr. Squires. So um, this funded my plane trip and then also um, paid for a lot of my rent while I was there. So basically I was helped a lot by the Budwine Scholarship. And then um, living in Boston was also a big adjustment. When it came to housing, if any of you all talked to me last semester, I was really, really freaking out about where I was going to live. They didn't give me anything, really. I was on my own, and I was basically on and off Craigslist and Airbnb trying to find a place to live for the summer. And I ended up staying in a little town called Somerville right outside of Boston. I had two random roommates. One was 35, one was 20-something. And um, what was really interesting was the 35-year-old roommate actually got her PhD at UTSA in neurobiology, so it was, one of my friends came to visit me and we brought her tortillas because she like missed the Texas food. So that was really fun. Um, next part that was really hard was public transportation. So I said I lived in Somerville, which was about three miles from Charlestown, which was across the river from Boston. 
and it took me over 30 minutes to get to work every day. And it was also really cold. And so first, um, I had to take a bus, and then I had to take a train, and then I had to take another bus, and then I had to walk. Um, and that was if it was raining. And I remember when I, my first two weeks there, everyone was complaining about how hot and humid it was. And I had to get coats donated from my doctor because I was freezing cold in the 40 degrees and raining weather. So um, another thing that kind of wasn't very fun was the buses and the trains would get very, very packed. So if I wanted to go to work <laughs> at 8 o'clock in the morning and come home before 5, I would have to wait for the second or third train to come by, and I would still like be smushed right here against the wall. Um, this is my friend Nicole, if you guys know her. She had a great time on that trip. <laughs> um, and so a little bit of what I did besides work, because I'll get to the work later. During the weekdays, I didn't really have a lot of time to do much, because I was going to work early and coming back late, so I didn't have to smell someone's armpits on the bus ride home. Um, so a lot of what I did was um, something that was cool about Boston is they had a lot of free community things to do. Um, I did things like November Project, which consisted of running the Harvard Stadium and getting passed by pregnant women on the stairs. And then I also did boot camps in some of the random parks in Boston. And so it was a really interesting way to meet new people and get out of your comfort zone. This right here was my very first day at this boot camp. And the trainer made me do piggyback rides with a guy that I never met. And he actually ended up being a Harvard researcher as well. So that was really cool. And then on the weekends, I got to do all the fun touristy things. I got to go see MIT. I got to see all of Boston. I even went on the Freedom Trail. I got to see Bunker Hill. I did a little yoga. Um, one, of my, one of the things I thought was really cool about Boston was there was so much history. And so right here, this is a South Meeting Hall. And right in front of it where all these people are is the site of the Boston Massacre. And um, I thought it was really amazing that they had this old historical building in the middle of all these skyscrapers. And they kept everything original that they could there. And it was really neat. I'm not very much of a history person, but this place really like sucked me in. Um, and then I also got to do other touristy things. Um, I went to Cape Cod. I did the museums. I did whale watching. I did the family tours all by myself. Um, <laughs> I got a lot of weird looks from the family photographers that were like, how many in your family? And I was like, just me and my Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> and so. Um, it was, it was a learning experience to be alone for so long. Uh, but then I also had a friend come visit me, which was free rooming for her. So obviously she came. We got to eat cannolis from Little Italy. We did salsa. We went to Boston Pops, which is like the third biggest firework thing on 4th of July after, I think, Washington, D.C. and New York. So it was really awesome. And then we also went to Fenway Stadium for the Boston Red Sox. And so. One of the things I want to share with you all is one of my most favorite places there was the Charles River. And it's called the Esplanade. And there's like this park where everyone just be, is like alone by themselves, but we're all together alone. And so it was really neat to see people like just laying on the ground or doing yoga or running or sitting and watching the sunset or sailing. And it made me feel a lot more comfortable to see all these other people alone with me. And so that was one of my favorite places to go and just hang out. And so next, the internship that I worked for was um, under Harvard Medical School. And I, under this internship, I was able to go to sit in Harvard Medical School classes. And that was um, really interesting. And it felt good to sometimes know what they were talking about. Um, and I also was working alongside a bunch of Harvard Medical School fellows. So these were all postdocs. Um, and down here is a picture of some of them. And in this picture, I'm the only person from the United States. I think um, everyone, it was so diverse in the office. There were people from Brazil. They were from Colombia. They were from Mexico, uh, Sweden, everything. And then they would always ask me, oh, you're, are you from here? And I was like, no, I'm from Texas. They're like, so you're from here? And I'm like, OK, I guess so. But um, all of those fellows worked for the neuromodulation lab with Dr. Felipe Fregni. And if you all haven't heard of him, I was kind of like fangirling over this guy because he's maybe 40, maybe not, but he already has over 300 different publications in the under neuromodulation and like neuro stuff. And so he was really smart and really helpful and he invited me to different lab meetings and I got to learn about a lot of things in their lab outside of my stuff. 
And then the second thing I did was I um, got to shadow at the Spalding Rehab Hospital. And this was technically where my research was based. Um, this is a Harvard Medical School teaching hospital for rehabilitation. And I got to shadow um, Dr. Nev, and she was working in the Lyme Clinic and also doing the PMNR. And then I also got to shadow a TBI specialist. And I think that there are some people in here who set that up for me because of my concussion story. So, so, so they let me um, go see a traumatic brain injury guy. And that was really cool, too. And one of the beautiful things about this hospital is every single room had this skyline view of Boston. It was floor to ceiling windows, and it was a beautiful place to, I guess, get better. And then the last, most important part of my research was the clinical research that I took part in. Um, the research that I did was a Lyme clinic that had just opened up called the Dean Center. And while I was there, we were working on two different studies that had just got approved by the IRB, which is a long and annoying process, but you have to do it. The first study was an Inyangar yoga study and then a TDCS study, which is transcranial direct current stimulation. And both of these were working in ways to rehab Lyme disease. And then, so one of the cool things that I got to see from a startup, a grassroots um, clinic, was I got to see how they fundraise. I got to see the behind the scenes work. I got to see the clinical development. And then I also got to collaborate with Johns Hopkins through a bunch of um, phone calls and stuff like that to really do everything we could to get all of our information in one place. And so now I'm going to give you guys basically the PowerPoint that I gave to all the Harvard doctors up in Boston, they, they got me to do a presentation there, which is a little bit more scary than this, but I'll give you all basically the same lowdown. Um, first things first is what is Lyme disease? I keep saying Lyme over and over. Um, Lyme disease is a tick-borne illness that's caused by Borrelia. Um, and it's, Borrelia has like a bunch of different species. There's 37 that we know of. And 12 of these have actually been confirmed to cause Lyme disease. In the US, there are three different kinds, but the one that people most hear of is Borrelia burgdorferi. And the shape of this uh, bacterium is a spiral sheet. So it's like a little spiral like you see in this picture. And what really worried scientists at first what it, is that it's the same shape as syphilis. So we were worried about is it able to be passed from human to human and things like that, but currently, um, we only know that it's been able to be transmitted from hum or tick to human, human to tick, or tick to animal, and things like that. It's not, we haven't confirmed any cases of like maternal to fetus transfer or things like that. And um, the tricky thing about this bug is that it's really good at surviving. So one thing that I found really interesting from the bio side, since much of my stuff was clinical, I decided to look a little on the bio side myself. Um, but the tick, the the bug sits in the tick's stomach, and the acidity of the, or the pH of the stomach is a lot uh, lower than the pH of human blood. So um, the bug did this really cool thing where it changed its protein expression when it goes from the tick to the human. And so uh, I thought that was, I mean, what a perfect vector to get into the body, if that's what you can do. Um, and then next thing that, the, that makes really is so hard to catch is that it also can change its gene expression once it's inside the body as well. So when it's in there and your body's fighting it off, it can, once it, after your body's like figured out what it is, it can go ahead and change it again so then your body has no idea where it's at. And so it makes it really hard to catch. And so the ticks that are infective are the Ioxo family of ticks and those are most commonly known as the deer ticks. And they have a two-year lifespan, but the time that they are most infectious are late spring to, early, to the end of the summer. And this is because the ticks that infect you are usually the nymphal-sized ticks. They're not adult ticks yet because in order to become infected, you have to have a tick attached for 24 hours. And the bigger ticks are easy to find, so you can remove them easily. But the ticks that actually infect you are the size of poppy seeds. And so just to give you all a little bit of an example of how tiny these things are. We have a little bagel, because everyone likes bagels. Um, and if you zoom in, you can still, you see the poppy seeds, but you still can't tell which one's a tick. And if you go in even more, you can see the tick right here resting among the poppy seeds. And these are the ticks that infect you. And it's really scary to think about, because if you're rubbing, it's like the size of a freckle on your hand or a period on a piece of paper. It's impossible to see if you're not looking. And then another example here is just, the size of it next to a normal tick that we would see on like normally dogs or things like that. 
and then also a, si a bunch of ticks on your hand. So if you look, it's like, if you look at your own hand, you can imagine how tiny that is. And so basically how you determine if someone has Lyme disease, there are three different, <laughs> there are three different stages of this, this infection. And so it starts at the early localized state, which is about three to 30 days after you've been bitten by the tick. And it's most commonly notified by the, the bullseye rash, the erythra migrans. And the problem with this is it only shows up in about 70 to 80 percent of the patients who get bitten by the tick. And um, it can get really big or it can stay small, but it doesn't hurt, it doesn't itch. So if you're not looking in your crevices for tick bites, you're not going to notice it was there. And then another uh, um, symptom is that people experience flu-like things. So they're really tired and they're not feeling good, they're cold and they're sweating. And, um, What's alarming to doctors is that they have these symptoms in the middle of the summer, and so we're not normally looking for flu patients in the summer, and so that's the first thing that they notice. But also, these symptoms are both not always there, so you can never really tell if someone has it or doesn't. And the second part is the disseminated state, and then basically if you don't get treated, it could result in more rashes. Bell's palsy, which is partial paralysis of the face, you can have meningitis. Um, your joints will swell up, but even so, like sometimes these symptoms will go away, sometimes they'll stay, sometimes they'll lead to other complications, but all in all, it's not really a defined exact symptom base that you can tell if you have Lyme disease. And then the last stage is if you are untreated, you can get random, random moments where you're hurting really bad in certain areas of your body, it just shows up in random places, and then if you are untreated, less than 5% sometimes develop different neurological problems like problems with short-term memory or numbness and things like that. And so the way that we currently diagnose this is um, through a CDC test. So the first thing they do is they look to see if you have these signs and symptoms that I said only sometimes happen. And so if you have these symptoms and you also have a history of exposure to ticks, which doesn't really make sense because ticks are everywhere, but they're only looking to see if you've been in the woods or things like that, um, then and only then will the CDC let them administer the blood test. And this blood test uh, only tests for one strain of Borrelia. And I mentioned before that there are 37 different strains and 12 that we know cause the disease, and the CDC only tests for one. And so this test can be really, really inaccurate. And if you see right here, it says that you can use these if you've had, if you've been bitten less than 30 days. So if you never remember getting bit by that tiny little poppy seed tick, you won't, this test, this blood test probably won't even be positive. And so the way that they treat it is they basically dose you with a bunch of antibiotics. They put you on a bunch of drugs and they try and flush it out of your system. And if you get it early enough and you have all those like normal symptoms and everyone knows that you have it, then a lot of people recover. But still, even if you catch it early enough, there's still a little bit over 35% of people that still have, will still have symptoms after being treated. And so this is called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. What PTLDS, and I'm gonna refer it to chronic Lyme from now on because that's a really long thing to say. Um, what that means is that you've been treated with antibiotics, but you're still sick, you're still hurting, you're still tired, and as of right now, the cause is pretty much unknown. Research is still being done to find that. And one of the interesting things that I found was the prevalence of this disease is growing. Um, this is like a little animation here, and it just shows from the years and years how, how big it's becoming a problem, and if you notice also, it's mostly localized in these 13 states up towards the Northeast and Upper Midwest, but at the same time, it's still spread out through here as well, so it's not non-existent in the rest of the country. And here's just another general map so you can see a little bit better. But the other thing that really, really bothered me was that the CDC themselves said that they are reported 30,000 cases of Lyme disease every year. And this means that they went through their blood test and confirmed, te they had a confirmed positive blood test and they told the CDC, yes, they have Lyme disease. But the CDC also admitted themselves that their blood tests could be inaccurate. 
and they actually believe that the, the number is closer to 300,000 of new cases every year of Lyme disease. So these aren't the patients who are still hurting from three years ago, these are new cases. And so it's kind of terrifying if you look at the incidence compared to things like West Nile malaria, HIV, and then if you come down here and look at how much we spend per patient. So when patients have Lyme disease, since there's no real definition of it yet, insurance doesn't always pay for that. So a lot of the patients that I saw this summer, all of their, all of their doctor visits were coming straight out of pocket. All of their medicine was straight out of pocket because it wasn't covered by insurance. And so the problem with this disease is there's a huge controversy um, on whether or not it actually exists. And it sounds crazy, like people are sick. Yes, Lyme disease exists, but people actually still believe, and people meaning doctors and scientists, that Lyme disease does not exist, or chronic Lyme does not exist. And so what they believe is that it's an autoimmunity infection. It's an autoimmunity problem. So basically, you are getting sick, and it's hard to figure out that you're sick, but once you're sick, we got you, you're cured. And then the reason that you're still feeling not so good is because your body's attacking itself. You're having an autoimmune reaction. And they don't think that you should use antibiotics. Even if it's helping, they think that in the long run, it's not going to be good for you. On the other side of the story, we have people who believe that chronic Lyme is actually a thing. And these people think that it's due to a persistent infection. They think that the bacteria, after you're flushed with antibiotics, there's still little pieces of it that are surviving. And so they think that you still need to be treated with antibiotics because it's making you feel better, it's making you do better, and they actually have proven that this chronic Lyme, the leftover bacteria was the case in different primates and mice. And so that was like, I think it's a really big step. And so this, mis this controversy, I think, leads to a lot of misdiagnosis. People who get PTLDS or chronic Lyme, they're, they're at risk of not being treated because doctors don't believe it exists or they're being turned away or referred to other doctors or diagnosed with other things like arthritis or autoimmune diseases. Another problem that I noticed while I was working a lot with the clinic was I think the um, education and media of this disease. So first of all, education-wise, the general public and doctors all, all around the board need to be more informed about what Lyme disease is so that we can better help patients who have it. Um, they need to understand that not all patients will show the same. Some will have the rash, some won't. Some will have arthritis, some won't. But it's, it's not a clear-cut answer on what this patient's going to have. And then also, um, they need to be clear that sometimes the blood tests aren't exactly going to be right if you don't hit the person in the right window of time from when they were bit. And um, Dr. Bergdorfer, he's actually the guy who discovered Borrelia. <laughs> Bergdorferi, and so his opinion on it, which I thought was pretty interesting, was that um, doctors don't exactly want to admit that they don't understand Lyme, and so they're scared to treat it, and that's a lot of the reasons why they turn them away, because it's not something they understand, and a lot of times for patients, in order that for them to get treated, it takes the humility of the doctor to say, I don't know what Lyme is, but I'm going to do everything I can to figure out how to help you. And another thing is the media. So. How many of you watch Dr. Phil? Okay. So <laughs> Dr. Phil had a whole Lyme thing on there after Avril Lavigne um, came out that she had Lyme disease. And I thought it was really interesting to watch this and see how selective their information was. And it was almost like they were trying to scare you about Lyme disease. So if you Google Lyme, these are the pictures that come up. And someone in this room right now has Lyme disease and they don't look like that. And so it's really, it's really interesting to see, like, people aren't going to believe you if you don't look like this. If you're not really suffering, then you don't have Lyme disease. But Lyme doesn't show up the same in everybody. It's different. And I think that's a big problem that I think we can fix, not as doctors, but we can spread the word about how Lyme really manifests itself. And this, again, leads to misdiagnosis because it's, it's vague. It's nonspecific. You don't exactly know what each person is going to have. It's really repetitive on what the problem is here. And so the next thing I want to talk about is a patient story. So while I was in Boston um, doing my research, I called up a friend who has, who has Lyme disease, and she came out with it last year. And I kind of took a personal statement to kind of give you all a little insight about what it's like to have this disease that nobody believes exists. Um, so this person is Molly Wagner, 
and she came to Texas Lutheran from Tennessee, and she plays soccer and track and cross country here. And I remember freshman year, at the end of the year, she had these shin splints that were just really bad, and they wouldn't go away, and we all were just telling her, Molly, you're doing too much. You're not taking care of yourself. You're just doing too many things. This is why you're sick. Well, it didn't get better. She ended up getting a bone scan, and it found out that she had fractures in both knees, both shins, both ankles, and the girl was in boots on both legs. She was walking around campus with like, boots not as cute as mine, but she was clomping around all the time. And um, she started going to doctors outside of the training staff once the training staff couldn't really do much more for her. And she went to do two different orthopedic docs, two different, or an endocrinologist, asthma doctors, allergy doctors, cardiologists, and she was diagnosed with this. She had stress fractures. She had posterior media tibia stress syndrome, asthma, allergies, osteopenia, which I thought was insane because a 20-year-old college athlete does not seem like the perfect person to have osteopenia. Um, they told her she had thyroid deficiency, arthritis, and they even told her she was crazy. They said it was all in her head. She's not really hurting. And so talking to Molly, um, it's a really long quote, but bear with me. She, how many of you play sports in here? How many of you have been injured for like a week? How much did that suck? <laughs> I mean, being out of your sport that you love is one of the most frustrating things to do, but this girl was out for nine months. She was in two boots on each leg for four months, and she took bone density shots. To, she had to give them to herself every, um, for five straight months. She went to physical therapy, changed her running form, changed her shoes, stayed off her legs, did all of this, came back nine months later, stepped on the grass, and nothing changed. It still hurt. And so she took the advice from whatever doctor it was and thought she was crazy. She thought that she wasn't sick. She thought that she was imagining the pain, and she thought that she wasn't hurting, so she just had to learn to suck it up. And so what happened next was her parents moved from Tex or Tennessee to Texas, and it was really easy for her to kind of hide her pain when she only saw them on vacations or only saw them for a week at a time. But when they were here and saw her every day, they could tell that something was wrong, something was different. And around that time, at the end of between our sophomore and junior year, two of her childhood friends that she grew up with were both diagnosed with Lyme disease. And this got her and her parents thinking, okay, well, something was wrong with them too, and they found out what was wrong, so maybe this is what I have. So basically what they did was they called an iGenix lab in California, and they gave her a very tiny short list of doctors in Texas that would treat Lyme. And so she went to go see one of those doctors, and of course her insurance wasn't gonna cover it, from, so from here on out, everything was out of pocket. Um, after all this testing, she was diagnosed with Lyme disease, and they put her on antibiotics, and currently she's on a gluten-free, soy-free, corn-free, dairy-free, and wheat-free diet. And the doctor that she has to go see is four to five hours away. So it's not like it's right here at home. She has to take a long trip, weekend trip, to go see her doctor. Um, this new doctor is an internal medicine specialist. They put her on a new diet, new antibiotics, um, they did all sorts of testing because the thing with Lyme disease is if anything happens to suppress your immune system at all, that's when it's going to flare up. That's when it's like, hi, I got you. I'm going to come out now. So if you're eating something you're allergic to or you're getting stressed out, it's going to pop up and make you feel a lot worse than you need to. And so I think one of the best things that Molly had in the situation was her mom. One of the sadder things that I saw in the Lyme Clinic in Boston was a lot of these patients had lost their families because their families believed that they too were crazy. And this is up northeast where this is a very common disease, but their families didn't think that they were sick. They thought they were just complaining and hurting and making it all up and they were nuts, so they left them. They abandoned them. And so Molly's mother stuck by her side throughout everything. That She watched her struggle, but she did everything she could to try and help her, and she was really a rock for this girl. So. Props to Mal's mom. Um, so it's been a long road. Um, Molly now, she still runs. She still plays. After nine months off, she's still there. And it's, when, I mean, if you talk to her, it's a pretty crazy thing that, to see how positive she is after going through all this and people not believing her. But it's also really empowering and inspiring to see that she still does it. When I showed this to the Harvard doctors, they were like, are you kidding me? 
she's still running more than a mile? This girl is nuts. And I was like, don't say that out loud. But um, they were really amazed by all that she was able to do while being infected with this disease. And so what are we doing to fix this problem? And that's where I did my research at the Dean Center. And what this center was, what their goal is to rehab and treat people who have the chronic Lyme like Molly does and to treat people who can't find people who don't think they're crazy. And so there are three main things they want to do is research, treatment, and education. And I took um, a lot of my role was in the education side. So we were trying to do a translational type research where you take what you're learning and um, immediately like push it into treatment and try and get these people better at the same time as educating their families, educating the patients, and letting everyone know like what is going on with their body. And so, of course, if you don't know, if you've gotten bitten by a tick, it's always good to know the preventative stuff. So my first advice is to create a no-tick zone, put bug spray on. Everyone ha hates the smell of bug spray, but in the long run, Lyme disease versus bug spray, I'd pick bug spray. Um, the best way to put it on is to put it in places that you don't think of. Um, usually when I do it, I just spray it all over really quick, but the ticks like to hide in your armpits, your knees, your, your waistband, places that you wouldn't really think to spray the bug spray in the first place. And then I'll, you can also do like regular tick body checks and just feel your body to see if there's anything that's out of the ordinary. And then also check your pets. There are a lot of stories that I heard of that they think that their, their dogs brought the ticks inside and they didn't even know and then ended up catching Lyme disease. And the next thing is if you do get bit, because it's going to happen, um, you can actually take your tick out and save it and send it to a lab to test if it has Lyme disease. So the local lab here is in Austin, and you can actually just put it in a Ziploc baggie and ship it off. And yes, the ticks that you are getting infected by are the little tiny ones, but it still helps us for research and incidence purposes to find the older ticks that are still have Lyme disease but aren't there long enough to infect you. And it's also really precautionary so that you can get treated with antibiotics right away if you know this tick has Lyme. And so here's a nice gross little <laughs> gift down here that tells you how to take it out. And it's important that you don't mash the tick up because it's really hard to analyze after that. But so if you do get tick by a bit, uh, or bit by a tick, <laughs> um, save it and send it to Austin. And so that way we can really keep track of how how much this disease is in our area. All right, and so lastly, I have my acknowledgments. Um, I'd like to first and foremost take, uh, thank Dr. Crandell and Dr. Nev. They are both the head of the Dean Center right now, and Nev, like, let, like she took me on and let me follow around like a sick puppy and <laughs> bought me organic food at Whole Foods. Like, what more could you ask for? Um, and then also other employees of the Dean Center, Dr. Andrum was my advisor while I was there, so he helped me out a lot with, with learning how clinical research works, because I'm a, I'm a chemistry lab rat. I don't know how different it is to work with people. And um, also, two other people who worked in the group were super awesome, were Carrie and Laura, and they helped me a lot along the way there. And also Dr. Jonas. <laughs> Because he, um, apparently, Nev was like his baby when she was here. And so <laughs> while I was up in Boston, she was like, oh, yeah, this is my prodigy. And I was like, OK, I'll be you when I get older. I don't really care. Um, but Dr. Jonas really connected me with Nev. And it was an experience of a lifetime. I can never thank him enough for that. And so the next was the Budwine Scholarship Committee. Um, no way I could have afforded it without that. And then Harvard Medical School and Spalding Rehab for taking me on as a as a member this summer and being really welcoming. And then lastly, my family, because I needed those Skype dates after being alone for so long. Like, <laughs> it was really necessary. But then they made it, they made it possible, too. So those are the people I'd like to thank. And then um, does anyone have any questions? You can ask me. And then I also have Molly in here if you all have any questions for her.
I think that what's happening is there's more doctors out there who are willing to work with Lyme disease and learn about it because it's there and the CDC says like they're, they're one tenth of the way of getting the actual number of people to come forward with Lyme disease. So I think that um, a lot of good things are happening and in order to get a hold of that, we need more doctors willing to treat it. And so while I was up there, this Lyme clinic was just opened like the week I got there and we had people traveling from over an hour away to come see us and asking if their Lyme friends could come see us. And so it's, really, it's a really high demand for doctors who care about Lyme. I have no idea. I think um, more research to like to figure out how it's persisting. Um, I think the primates were a good first step, but to show them that yes, it's actual bacteria that's still in your body because that's why they're prescribing the antibiotics is to still treat them. And as of right now, the cause is unknown to the CDC. A better test would probably help a lot. Yeah, because it's only testing for one strain, and it's only a certain window of time and it's only this or that, and you have to have this, or it's not defined. Very nice paper. Do we have much Lyme disease in Guadalupe County? Or so there's actually this website that tells you how many cases have been reported in your area. Um, I looked up this place, and it was like three. But that's just reported, because you think of how hard it was for Molly to find a Lyme doctor here. So nobody even, I mean, someone walking around with arthritis could have Lyme disease, and you would never even know because it's not something we're looking for. Um, up northeast, it's a little bit more common for them to look for it. But when I showed you that prevalence map, there were still little dots of areas throughout the country that had Lyme disease, so it's not really something we're looking for, I think. Uh, because it's unknown, do they use Lyme as a general antibiotic to treat it, or is there a specific antibiotic? Um, they use pretty strong ones. I. It's really far back, but um, yeah, it's, it's just a bunch, they'll, they'll like rotate you on antibiotics too, so you're having different ones, but it's, they use the stronger ones, it's not like overkill or anything. Yes? Are they uh, developing new diagnostic methods for it? They're trying, and that's what um, I think a lot of the research is, they're, they're trying, it's but they, helpful, right? yeah. They're trying, and they're trying to get vaccines, and they're trying to do all these things. And while I was in Boston, something that was really cool was I was able to take part in a Lyme conference. And what made me really excited about this was just that it was hosted by the CDC. So they had all these scientists and doctors come in and talk about Lyme disease and talk about the, the deep, dark, scary, science-y words of Lyme. And the fact that the CDC was actually hosting it made me think that they're opening up to the idea that this is a real problem. Yeah. Yes. What? Okay, so there was like. No. The problem, I remember t they were talking about this, was that the way that they brought forward the, the vaccine was just the wrong way. Um, they, there was a lot of problems with the media, and then there was like one or two people who got sick, and there was like, it was a big media blowout, and they were like, no, no Lyme disease vaccines. So now they have to think of a new one. Liability is a big thing mm -hmm. in vaccines. Yeah. Why is it called Lyme disease? Where's the word Lyme disease? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, know, I, know. I was like, she told me this the other day, but. Lyme, you, Lyme, Connecticut was where it was. Okay, from. it was Connecticut. We were like Maine or Although something. Although it's worldwide. Yeah, it's, it's like in place. Europe too and things like that, so it's not just to this continent either. Right. You were raising your hand? Okay. Any yes. more questions? Yes. Um, you said that dogs get it too, right? Yeah, dogs can so get it. That I did not work with, so I wouldn't be able to give you a straightforward answer on that. I would doubt it. Yeah. It's still like a timing thing. The tests that we have are all just if you catch it at the right time. Because Molly's blood test came back negative. Because hers were years after she got bit is when her symptoms hit her. <laughs>